you're being seated there, I want to invite you to reach and grab your copy of God's Word and uh, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17 as we continue in our series uh, that we've been over the last couple of weeks entitled Golden Oldies. If you're here before the service, uh, we're playing a few uh, of the real oldies back from the 50s, but we're also looking through the Old Testament uh, at some of the most well-known stories that you and I probably have heard over and over and over over again, and we're bringing fresh light and fresh spirit to those stories as we just glean the insights from them. Now, uh, my prayer today, as we come to one of the most well-known stories in all the Bible, not uh, only in the church, but those outside the church, it's the story of David and Goliath. Uh, My prayer all week has been this. First of all, that you wouldn't check out that you wouldn't sit there and say, know the story, David wins, little guy beats big guy, I'm done. My prayer is that you wouldn't check out. My second prayer has been this, that you and I would look at the insights that we glean from David's victory over Goliath, and then we take them and apply them in our lives. And so wherever you are today and whoever you are, whether you're in the room, whether you're just viewing online, there are six life lessons that you and I can see right here from the story of David and Goliath that will allow us to face our fears and to face those giants in our life. You know, I I think as I've been praying and thinking through it and thinking about, all right, what have been some of the giants and the Goliaths in my past? What are uh, some of the giants and difficulties that I know people in our church are facing, uh, those that uh, they've faced over the last couple of years? I, I think there's kind of a continuum that people have a tendency to approach their problems with. I think sometimes uh, there are people that they're over here on the fear side. It seems like if a problem comes their way, uh, they're always believing that the sky is falling. This is the worst diagnosis ever. Uh, Things are always going to end badly, always going to be in fearfully. And I think there are times that people, when a problem comes their way, they are frozen in fear. Now, we know as children of God, how many of you know that as children of God, we need to live by faith, right? So if you think on the opposite end of the spectrum, there would be those of us who are followers of God that regardless of what comes my way, I understand that God is on my side. God has got this. Man, God is going to work it all out. And regardless of how big Goliath is, I can be a David or a, uh, a Davette uh, for God, and I'll always get the victory. And man, we can think of people that are always frozen in fear. I can think of people, and perhaps you can as well. Uh, I can think of people that I've known in my past that they always seem to approach every problem, every difficulty, every hardship with an attitude of faith. But I will tell you this, I also believe that most of us are somewhere in between. Kind of this uh, spectrum that we have a tendency to move between faith and fear. I will tell you as your pastor, this is a lot of the way I live that there have been times that regardless of what's coming my way, man, I am a person of incredible faith, uh, and we can certainly think of examples. There have been times that I have been frozen in fear. I, I think the space that I have a tendency to live in a lot is called fearth. It's kind of that space between fear and faith. Am I the only one that kind of lives in the land of fearth? And, and we all do, Right? Man, we can think of the Josephs in the Bible or or, or a couple of other names through the history of Christianity. They always seem to dwell in the area and space of faith. But I want you to know, I think we're all kind of moving back and forth from time to time. And so my encouragement, as we go back to this story of David and Goliath, that wherever you are on this continuum, wherever you are in this space called fear, that we would move more and more towards living a life of faith. You say, Pastor, what is real faith? Um, I I want you to know, faith is not a feeling. That man, all of a sudden, if you hear a song, you get goosebumps and you think, I can do this. That's not faith. I want you to know, uh, faith is not desire. Faith is not really, 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 really wanting something. Faith is comes when I fully and completely know that, man, God's will for my life is to do this or that. 
And since, here's the faith part, since that is absolutely God's will for my life, I believe that God will give me the victory over whatever I'm facing. That is real faith. So now that causes us to step back in any difficulty, in any hardship, in any problem that we are experiencing, that we have to step back and say, God, what is your will in this situation? How do you want me to handle this crisis? How do you want me to handle this problem? How do you want me to react to this person or this struggle? We need to step back and say, God, what is your will? And then as children of God, we have to trust just exactly what we're saying, that if this is God's will, God is going to make a way. Now, let's drop into this story real quickly. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let's jump all the way down to the bottom, verse 50. Notice what it says. It says, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine, and he ultimately killed him. Now, as we think about David in this story, as we get to this point, you might think David kind of comes out of nowhere to get the victory. David was the underdog, certainly was the underdog. We're going to read about that here in a few seconds. But I want you to know, David doesn't come out of nowhere to get this victory. We're going to see some things that David had done all of his life, faithfully preparing for this moment and for this season. And that should encourage you and I today that wherever we are in this continuum between fear and faith, that you and I just need to be faithful to do what God is calling us to do today, and we will hone our skill and grow our faith. And when that day comes that I am facing Goliath, then I can stand with courageous conviction that God is ultimately going to give me the victory. Now, as we roll through this story, we're going to see a couple of different personalities. But I, I, I was asked this week, now, now wasn't Saul uh, a big, strong, handsome man? Wasn't he tall? And wasn't David a little runt? And, and so I thought I would go ahead and just jump out uh, for you, bring a couple of verses out, tell you, hey, uh, what was Saul like? What was David like? Let's pick them up. Let's read just two verses real quickly. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. This is where we're introduced to King Saul, all right? That the children of Israel had rejected God's leadership. They wanted an earthly king. And so now notice 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. We are introduced for the first time to Saul. It says, Kish had a son named Saul, who is now King Saul during the episode of David and Goliath. He was as handsome a young man as could have been found anywhere in Israel. So Saul was handsome, and he was a head taller than anyone else. So here's what we know, is that Saul was a good-looking dude. He was an Adonis-looking dude, and he was tall, and he was powerful, and he was strong. So what do we know about David? A lot of times we think, well, David must have been this little runt. Well, let's read and see what Scripture says about David. If we jump forward, fast forward to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 12, where we meet David, notice what happens. It says, so they sent for him. Now, here's what we do know, is that David was the youngest at that moment, at that time, the youngest of his father's son. He was the one that was a shepherd out in the field. Believe it or not, it was out in the field. That's when David prepared to face Goliath. So if you feel like you're on the backside of the wilderness, you're watching over sheep, and your job's not that important in the church or in ministry or wherever you are, I want to encourage you, you be faithful doing what you're doing because God's preparing you for something. So notice what it says. They sent for him. He was the last of the sons. They brought him in. Notice what it says. He was glowing with health, had a fine appearance, was a handsome dude, and had handsome features. Now, what do we know? Either David's brothers were really, really ugly, or he was a pretty good looking dude. That, that they didn't necessarily think he was going to be the son that would be king over Israel. They didn't necessarily think that he was the tallest one in the batch. They didn't think that he was the Adonis of the kids. But what we do know is he's a pretty sharp looking dude. Notice what it said, and the Lord said, rise up and anoint him. So as we think about David, David's not necessarily a runt, but Saul definitely turned out to be a nut, all right? Saul was all about himself. Now, when we come to this story and we see Saul and David, Saul had some skins on the wall. 
Saul was pretty much a terrible king, but he was a pretty good warrior. David was able to put it all together. He was a solid warrior, and he turned out to be a pretty good king, but he wasn't perfect. And as we think here on this day in Father's Day, man, you say, what are dads supposed to be like? We think we're supposed to be mighty warriors. Absolutely. Go look at David's life. David was a warrior king. He defeated Philistine after Philistine after Philistine. Here we're going to see that he defeats Goliath. But you also go look at the Psalms. Man, look at some of the poetry that David wrote. So you say, what is a father to be like? Was David a father figure when he was a mighty warrior? Absolutely. Was David a father figure when he was a motive and expressed his feelings through the Psalms? Absolutely. So dads, it's a mixture of both. So if nothing else, when we spend time today with our families or make phone calls, I want to encourage you, be a mighty warrior for God, but also let your family know how much you love them and care about them. So as we journey through this idea and we think about Saul and David, here's the story. And I'm going to share with you six lessons, hopefully from this story, and hopefully you won't check out because I think they apply to all of us today. So as we think about these six lessons, here's the story in brief. You have Goliath, who is a Philistine, who is walking down in the valley each and every day, screaming at the children of Israel, come down, send a man out to fight to me, fight me. Now, here's what had happened. There in the valley on one hillside were the Israelite army, and the other, uh, other hillside was the Philistine army. And Goliath would come down, and he would mock God, And he would laugh at the children of Israel as the champion of the Philistines who was massive and large. And he would say, send someone out to fight. Day after day after day, this happened. And nobody from the children of Israel would step forward to go and fight. Not even Saul, who should have been the one that was willing to do it since he was the king over Israel. Or at least Saul should have chosen someone. You go try it. And David shows up. What had David been doing? He had been keeping his father's sheep. All David went to the battlefront for was a welfare check. Go read it in 1 Samuel chapter 17. It says, David's dad calls him in, says, hey, here's some food, here's some stuff, uh, here's some barley, here's some loaves of bread. Hey, go to the battle lines because this is what his father said, your brothers are fighting fiercely in Saul's army. Well, there wasn't a lot of fighting that was going on. So the stories of their bravery apparently had been exaggerated. And David's father said, listen, go do a welfare check on your brothers. See how they are. So David shows up to the Israelite army. He's brought the food, and he happens to be there when Goliath steps out and says, hey, someone from you come out and fight me. Whoever wins, we will serve the other one. David hears that, and David says, hey, guys, how long has that been going on? He is mocking us, and he's laughing at our God. And they said, well, he kind of does it every day. And David says, has anyone stepped out to fight him? They go, not yet. Have you seen the size of that critter? And David asked a question. David says, what's going to be done for the man that goes out and defeats Goliath? And the men begin to tell him. They say, here's what's going to happen. The king has already said, if there's a man that will step up, can go defeat Goliath, there are three things that are going to happen. First of all, Saul is willing to give them, give that man one of his daughters as a wife. That's not a bad gig. Number two, Saul has already said, I will give that man who defeats Goliath incredible wealth so the family will not ever have to worry about money again. The third thing may have been best of all. You can go read it. Saul had already said, listen, the one who defeats Goliath doesn't have to pay taxes. Now, that is the best reason of all to go after your Goliath. How many of us understand that in today's culture, right? And all of these things are going to be done. Now, notice what's going to happen. All David does is ask a question, and his brother begins to get jealous. So let's look at these six lessons. Six lessons, here's the thought number one, is we all have giants we have to face. Every person in this room, every person viewing online, you've got a giant. I don't know what your giant is, but I will tell you this. Here's what I know about my giants. They're usually giant. They're usually pretty big. 
Your giant might be, um, it might be financial. It, it might be relational. It might be fear that you have over and over again, you know what you need to do, you know what God has called you to do, but you are frozen in fear. And these words keep coming back over and over. I can't do that. I can't do that. That is a fear-based doubt that you can do it. I think there are some people it's not I can't that they doubt. I think some people it's I won't. That, That we have a motivation problem that God says, here's what I want you to do for me and my kingdom. Here's how I want you to lead my family. And it's not that you can't, it's that you won't. That perhaps you've got a motivation problem or just somewhere in your past, somewhere in days gone by, you kind of flick the switch and your spiritual leadership, your spiritual commitment to God, your service to God's church, your service to God's kingdom, you've kind of put it on autopilot. And you're just kind of rolling along, and, and, and as long as you roll in on Sunday and you get a decent message and you do this and you do that and you go away, that's enough. But I want you to know every person here, part of the lesson is God is calling every one of us to do more for Him in His kingdom and in His space and in His way. Man, here's what else I know about me. There are times that giants will absolutely bring us to our knees. We all have them. We all struggle with them. They are big. They are scary. And here's what else I know. I have noticed about my giants is they don't always come single file, well spaced out. How many of you know that? It seems like they show up in groups. My mom has a phrase when you tell her, hey, what this just happened. My mom always just says, and she's on campus today. It's good to have her. She rolled in. Uh, she, she always says, well, be careful. They always come in threes. Now, that's not in the Bible, but, but I've experienced that, haven't you? It seems like when one shoe drops, another shoe drops, and then you're like, where'd that third shoe come from? Somebody threw it at you, Right? And we all face giants, and and we all have these fears, and we always have these worries. Some of you, your giant, it it is an I can't, it is an I won't. Some of you, it's I'm hurt. The man, you are sitting here right now in a season, and someone has hurt you, or you are struggling. Maybe you've been through a divorce or maybe this is going to be your first Father's Day alone and you are hurt. I want you to know God has a plan for you. Maybe some of you have experienced betrayal of somehow, some, some way or rejection by other people. Man, those are giants that we have to overcome. But thought number one as we look at this story is we all absolutely face giants. Let's look at the giant that we see in the story as we pick it up and we begin to read. Uh, If you'll notice in verse 4, it says, A champion named Goliath. What do we know about Goliath? It says he was from Gath, came out from the Philistine camp. Day by day, it says he was massive, he was large, he was a big giant. Look at verse 8. Goliath stood and shouted at the ranks of Israel, all the soldiers of Israel. Why do you come out? And line up for battle. Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have that person come out and fight against me. Man, I want you to know I truly believe that God is looking for men who will step up and say, I'll be that man. I really believe that God is looking for some ladies in this room to say, count on me. I'm willing to step up. I'm willing to fight the battle. I think there are singles and marrieds that God is calling us to say, you can count on us and you can count on me. But thought number one, when we think about defeating our giants, we all have giants. Here's thought number two. When you are willing, like David, to say, I'm willing to do it, don't be shocked when others doubt your potential. Don't be shocked when others doubt your potential. That's exactly what happened. So all of a sudden, David said, hey, I'm in on the no taxes thing. And so David says, I'll go fight him. Notice what happens. As we see right here, pick it up in verse 28. It says, when Eliab, that's his brother. That's the brother 
that David was there to bring food and encouragement to and news of how Eliab was going to do back to his father. It says, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger and asked him, why have you come down here? And notice this little zinger he puts in there. And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? What is he doing? Man, he is slapping a zinger at David going, listen, why are you coming up here? Why are you stirring the pot? I'm the shoulder in the family. You're the shepherd. And he goes, and by the way, those few sheep, where'd you leave those? What is he doing? He's trying to put David, cut David down to size. He's trying to question his ability. He's doubting his potential. Then all of a sudden, David says, listen, what did I ever do to you? He looks at the man and he says, listen, take me to Saul. David goes to Saul. David goes up to Saul and says, listen, this Philistine that keeps attacking us over and over and day by day, he is challenging us. He is challenging our God. And he says to Saul, I will go fight his battle. I will go fight this battle. Notice how King Saul responds. Notice what it says. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant, he's talking about me, will go and fight for him. Notice verse 33. Saul replied, you can't do it. He says, you're not able to go against this Philistine and fight against him. You're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. Now, as we think about this story, I will tell you that I believe that there are about five groups of people in this story that are represented. And probably the same five groups of people are perhaps in this room or watching online. First thought is this, is there is the big E. There is the ultimate enemy. In this story, it's Goliath. In your life, in my life, it's Satan. Satan wants to do anything and every can't thing that he can to take us down. There is always Satan lurking around. How many of you understand? He is the big E. He is the ultimate enemy that he wants to take you down. He wants to freeze you in fear. But in this story, we also see a little E. That's Eliab. That's the brother who is jealous I want you to know I've encountered this in ministry, and probably so have you. As soon as you begin to step out in faith to do something, there will always be some little enemies that will look at you. They will doubt your potential. They will, they will talk about you. They will, they will tell you you can't do it, just like we saw in the story Eliab is sitting there. And Eliab says, man, why did you even come down here? And who did you leave your sheep with? And there are always going to be some people that if you say, you know what, I'm really sensed that God is calling me to do this or calling me to do that, there are going to be some people that doubt your potential. They, they, they oftentimes and sometimes are jealous. Sometimes they just truly don't think you're prepared. That's what we see with Saul. We see there, 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 here you have Saul. Saul had skins on the wall. Saul, Saul had been a king that was a horrible king but he had been a mighty warrior. But Saul wasn't willing to step up and go out and instruct someone on how to defeat Goliath the Philistine. I think there are times that we have people in our churches that they can look back and they can think back on when they really served God and they, they, they led this group or that group or they led this ministry or led that ministry, but all of a sudden now they've stepped back and they're like Saul. They have skins on the wall. They have a lot they could bring to the table. They have spiritual armor they could give to the next generation. But instead, they've stepped back from the battle. I think there are a lot of times it's not a big E or a little E or those who have stepped back from the battle like Saul. I want you to know God's calling us all to get back in the battle. I think there are some people here that, man, they just lack leadership. You say, Pastor, where did you see this group of people? I'm talking about the men of Israel. The people were part of the soldiers. What did it say? David was talking to the men. And, they, and he says, what is going to be done for the one who is willing to, fight, willing to fight the Philistine? At least they were there at the battlefront. All they needed was a leader to simply say, man, let's go. Let's fight. Let's battle. And let's fight on God's terms, not his terms. Then you have David. You have David who was the man 
who in that space, in that moment, said, I am willing to do whatever God has called me to do. And I will tell you today, I believe that there are a lot of folks here that, that, that you have uh, been caught in complacency. You've been frozen in fear. You've drifted away from, from, from God. You think, man, I'm just going to let someone else do it. I believe today that God is calling everybody in this room, everybody watching online, to step up and say, I am willing to take action against my giant and to serve God in his kingdom in this moment. You know, as you think through this story, man, we all have giants, number one. Number two, others are ultimately going to doubt your potential. And here's number three. Don't ever forget that every small challenge today prepares you for a bigger challenge tomorrow. Every challenge you face and every challenge I face today prepares me for a bigger challenge tomorrow. Think about David and his life. His brother was right. Eliab said, Eliab said, basically, you're not a soldier, you're a shepherd. Eliab says, where did you leave your sheep? Who's watching over them out in the wilderness? David had basically been out in the wilderness, not being a soldier all of his life. I just shared with you from 1 Samuel that David was actually out in the shepherd's field when he was called in and made king over Israel. That's all he had ever been. But here's the point. David was faithfully doing what he was asked to do by his father. He was faithful in the field. It was what he learned in the field that prepared him to fight the battle in the valley with the Philistine. So here's my encouragement to you. Don't ever, ever think... Well, you know what? If I ever get asked to do this, or if I ever find myself here, then all of a sudden, I will really serve God. I want you to know wherever you are right there, serve God with all of your heart, with all of your skill, with all of your talent, and with all of your ability. Fast forward all the way to the battlefield of David and Goliath. David picked up five stones. Why? I've heard some incredible messages on what each one of the five stones mean. You want me to tell you what those five stones mean? To me, here's what they mean. Those are some incredible sermons and incredible books. Let me tell you what they mean. David had missed before. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? David had probably been out in the wilderness and realized there were times I need more than one stone. But how many times had David been out in the wilderness, bored to tears, watching over the same sheep, coming up with games to play? Can I hit the cactus with the stone? He had no idea he was getting ready to someday be placed on the battlefield with Goliath. So here's my encouragement to you. If you think you're on the backside of nowhere, doing the front side of nothing, if you are doing it to your best and for God's glory, God is preparing you for something more. I am telling you that. Every challenge you face today leads to another one. What did David say when he walked into Saul? He said, listen, I'm willing to go and fight him. And Saul says, uh, he's kind of like a warrior. You're like a shepherd. This isn't going to work. What was David's response? He says, listen, out in the field, I killed the lion. I killed the bear. And he's got a bigger forehead. What was David saying? Man, I was faithful to protect the sheep because that's what I was asked to do. So here's my encouragement to you. Man, when you think about facing your giants, don't be shocked when others doubt your potential, but also don't miss the opportunity to excel where you are today because God wants to use you somewhere else tomorrow in a powerful and a real way. Here's number four from this story. Be yourself. Don't ever try to be someone else. I'm going to say that again. Be yourself. Don't ever try 
to be someone else. See, as you go into the story and you read down, it says, when David said to Saul, I'm willing to go and fight, Saul first said, you can't do it. David said, no, I can. I said, I've killed a lion, I've killed a bear, I've killed a lot of things protecting the sheep. I can certainly hit Goliath with the stone. What did Saul immediately do? It said Saul gave David his tunic, his armor, his sword, his boots, and his helmet. David put them on and said, I can't use these. Why? Because they weren't his. Child of God, don't ever try to be someone you are not. And don't ever try to wear someone else's armor. But it also tells us right now that that as we journey through life, when it comes to spiritual armor, kids, you can't wear your dad's spiritual armor. And dads, you can't wear your wife's spiritual armor. Wives, you can't wear your parents' spiritual armor. We all have to come to God and say, God, how have you gifted me? And how have you talented me? And how have you put me together? See, God has uniquely created each and every person in this room. He's given you your skills and your talents and your calling and your desires and your ability. Why? Because God wants you to be you and don't be someone else. You heard uh, one of our interns uh, uh, do the announcements a few minutes ago. One of the things that we love to do is bring in interns and just let them look around and figure out what ministry is all about. And many of them will move on. And one of the things we also do is we video and we talk about when they teach and when they preach. Here's how you could do this better and here's how you could do that better. It has not been that uncommon over the years that I can look at a video or I can watch one of our interns preach and I know who they're watching preach. I just notice the mannerisms. I notice what they say and what they do. And the challenge is always, man, don't be somebody else. Be who God has called you to be. When I first surrendered the ministry, I, I, the first preacher that I really sat under because I, I started off as a coach at First Baptist uh, Academy in downtown Dallas, and it was W.A. Criswell. How many of you remember W.A. Criswell? And, and W.A. Criswell, if you ever heard him preach, he, he loved literature, and there'd be times right in the middle of W.A.'s sermon that all of a sudden he would quote this long poem from memory. And it would be stirring, and it would be moving. And I remember as a young minister going, man, I've got to start memorizing poetry. And I started trying, and it was like every time I tried, it always kind of came out, flow like a butterfly, sting like a bee. And I thought, no, that's not me. And so here's the call, and here's the challenge. Man, you be who God has called you to be. Now, I want you to know you need to be out in the field perfecting your talent. Man, don't ever think there's too little, too little of a job or service or ministry that you can do for the church and God's kingdom that's not ultimately going to prepare you for something else. Why? Because God is going to use it all. God is going to use it all in a powerful, in a real way. God wants to use your skill and your ability. So let's pick it up and notice it as we think about don't be someone else as we look in verse 39. It says, I cannot go out there in these. This is what David said. Listen, I can't go in these. Why? Because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. And what did he do instead? He took what he knew. He took the talents. He took the skills. He took the abilities that he had. Then he took his staff in his hand. And he chose five smooth stones from the stream. He put them into his pouch in his shepherd's bag. That's what he had. And with his sling in his hands, he approached Goliath. Child of God, I'll submit to you that God has given you everything you need already. All you have to do is hone your skill, be willing to serve somewhere, be willing to step out in faith, and God will prepare you for the next thing ahead. Here's number five. You ready? As you journey towards the battle, expect God to give you the victory. 
Man, we don't need to roll into uh, a battle expecting to lose. We need to roll into the battle, even if it is against Goliath, and we need to say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, and this is totally a God thing, but God, I believe you've called me to this. You want me to overcome this, whatever it is, an addiction, a sin, a struggle, a a broken relationship, a loss of a job. God, I believe you want me to overcome this, and I'm going to expect, God, that somehow, some way, if I am faithful to do my part, that, God, you are going to do your part. Now, think about David. David did defeat Goliath, but not before practicing and honing his skill, faithfully being a shepherd for all of those years. Beyond that, David still had to be willing to fight through some doubters who tried to put put him back in his place. David still had to be willing to advance toward the Philistine, take a stone out, put it in his sling, and let it go. At some point, you and I, if all we do is sit here with stones in our bag, with a sling in our hand, and we never say, God, what do you want me to do, and how do you want me to act? If we never say that, we're going to miss the victory. But when we do make that advancement, we've got to expect that God is going to give us a victory. What does it do, mean, expect God's going to give us a victory? I'll tell you what, it'll change your perspective. When I begin to expect that God is going to help me overcome whatever giant, whatever struggle, whatever hurt, whatever hardship I face, when I begin to believe that God is going to give me the victory, it changes my perspective. Why? Because I'm going to begin to look at God and not the problem. God is going to get bigger and the problem is going to get smaller. I believe also expecting God to give us the victory, I think that honors God. That as a child of God, whatever I'm facing, whatever struggle I, I, I'm about to try to uh, overcome, if I sit here and say, God, I really believe that you've called me to do this. I see in God's word, here's what you want me to do. I've been faithful to do what you've called me to do. So God, I believe you're going to give me the victory. I believe it honors God. I also believe that it maximizes our potential for success. Once I've honed my skills, I've been faithful to God, I really sense through God and His Word and through worship and His way that God wants me to do this. Man, once I do what David did, which is grab the five smooth stones and begin to advance towards the enemy, I truly believe that I have a much greater shot at success. Why? I prepared for that moment. My prayer and my invitation, my question for you today is what is God preparing you for? And what are you doing to prepare? I'm going to ask that again. What is God preparing you for? And what are you doing to prepare? See, both of those have to come together. We see that in the battlefield. This was not David's first time to throw a stone. How many of you understand that? This was not the first um, enemy that David had to overcome with a stone. He had done it over and over and over again. Here's the final thought today. If you and I are willing to go to the battle, and we're willing to do it God's way, Our victory will inspire someone else. Just go read the story. It says those men that just lacked the leader, when they saw David kill Goliath, it said they began to advance and surge against the Philistines. People of God, people here at Cottonwood Creek, my prayer for us is that we will have a group of people that are constantly being prepared, that are constantly being faithful, that are constantly saying, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do it. And then notice it's going to inspire others. Those men that had been hiding up in the hills, they all of a sudden start advancing. Boy, if you think about Father's Day, Men, 
Our families need us to be willing to fight. And sometimes that just means showing up. My kids and my family have all been in one of these two. Some of them are in this. Some of them were in the early service. Here's the one thing I always want my kids to know. Their dad might not be the greatest, but he's always going to show up. He's going to be in the battle. When he gets knocked down, he's going to get back up. For everybody in this room, that's what your kids, that's what your family, that's what this church needs. It's people willing to take the skills that they have, the talents that God has given them, the abilities they have, and say, God, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. I'm willing to show up. I'm willing to sign up. I'm willing to be there. Why? Not because I've been perfect in the past, but because God has created me for this moment, for this season, and this time. My guess is for many here today that Father's Day is mixed with tears for some, celebration for others, Anxiety for others, loss for others. But in all of those, my prayer today is that you would step back and you would glean from these six lessons from David and Goliath. That you would be the kind of man and the kind of woman that says, God, I'm going to be faithful from this point on. I can't undo one lost battle of my past, but what I can do is say, God, from here on out, my family, my kids, my church can count on me. And I'm going to hone my skill because I believe that God has something greater for me still. And as we thought about how to close this service on Father's Day, we thought there was no better thing for us to do. Bring Jairus back out here in a second. And I'm going to pray that we'll stand and we'll sing not about how awesome we are, but about how deep the Father, the Father's love is for you and me. God, thank you so much for this day. God, as we come to this Father's Day in this moment, this season, God, our prayer, my prayer, is there will be men and women in this service and online They would say, count me in from this point on. That I'm willing to say yes to whatever God wants me to do for His kingdom and for His church. To say yes, I'm willing to stand in the valley and face a giant. I'm willing to hone my skill. I'm not going to be someone I'm not. I'm just going to be a sinner saved by grace believe the victory's ahead. Why? Because that's what God has called us to. In Jesus' name we pray.